I have a unique PhD, is, and you noted this in the introduction. It's very uncommon. There are only, I think, two institutions on the planet that grant a dissertation, a, a PhD in bioenergetics. Mm -hmm. Bioenergetics is a particular niche of, of, of research that combines the metabolism, biochemistry, and physiology, but with a heavy focus on thermodynamics and, and the relevance of thermodynamics in living systems because uh -huh. lest anyone have, has forgotten, thermodynamics was originally posited as a, as a view to make the better steam engine, that it is in the realm of physics, and it is, it is an odd... Uh, or it's an awkward fit to try to fit principles of physics in principles of biology. I actually think that it, it, it I'll, I'll make this kind of a bold claim. I consider the introduction of calories into biology as, as part of what got us where we got it wrong. It, it so thoroughly distracted us yeah. from, from, I think, what matters most that it, it actually brought us to where we are. I think the whole war on fat in part was born because of this improper introduction or invocation of, of thermodynamics. So, now, having said all that, calories matter, and those carbons need to be accounted for in some way. But a cell, like especially a fat cell, it needs to know when it's time to eat and when it's time to break down. And, and, the, and the fat cell wants to be and everyone, pardon me if it sounds like I'm being silly. I am, after all, a professor who teaches 18-year-olds, so I have to sometimes be a little juvenile in my description of things. But the fat cell needs to know that it's playing nicely in the entire neighborhood of the body. Mm -hmm. That it needs to know, okay, what are the demands of the brain right now? What are the demands of the muscle? Um, there's no direct nerve that's connecting them. It's hormones that generally will tell the overall orchestra when it's the woodwinds section to play, when it's the brass section, or when is it time for the muscle to be needing energy. But you couldn't, you don't want muscle to be exercising and pulling in energy to break it down. At the same time, fat is taking in energy to store. The body, in its overall balance of metabolism, wants to balance out the two parts of what is metabolism, anabolic versus catabolic. Insulin is the hormone that sends that signal. So this is my really long-winded way of just saying, I have right now down the hallway in my lab, fat cells growing in Petri dishes, like literally right now. I'm not even being um, hyperbolic here. Those fat cells, when we first plate them and they're sticking to the cell, to the bottom of the dish, they are in a bath of tons of calories. Tons of fat and tons of glucose. Everything a fat cell wants in order to grow. But it stays small until we do one single thing, which is add insulin into the culture. The moment insulin comes into that little culture media, we call it, or that bath, now the fat cells would say, if they were part of the greater whole, ah, it's time for me to eat. This is my signal that it's time to store energy rather than break it down. And now we look, if we look at those fat cells just four to six hours later, they're actually thicker, chubbier. If we mm. look at them six hours later, still they're bigger again. So all of this is just to say that there must be a stimulus that tells the fat cell to grow, which is elevated insulin. And then there must be sufficient calories to fuel that growth. You cannot have one without the other. And, and just to really put a fine point on that, if a person had high insulin and low calories, they will die because they would become mm -hmm. hypoglycemic and there would be no ketones being produced because the high insulin would be inhibiting ketogenesis. And then the brain would have been deprived of its two fuels and the body would shut off. The brain would shut off. Now, in contrast, if insulin's low and calories are really high, what happens then? Now the person is burning up almost. They, they burn to death where their, their metabolic rate and their ketogenesis is unstoppable because there's nothing to tell the body to stop burning energy. And so they die from ketoacidosis and hyperglycemia. But this is a scenario which is so real that, and it works, where the, you can eat as much as you want, that people with type 1 diabetes, some of them have learned and are so tempted that they can deliberately underdose their insulin level 
and be into a state of ketoacidosis and massive hyperglycemia and feel miserable and wretched, and yet they will be as thin as they want. Just everyone imagine the temptation. You know, they don't have to vomit up their food. They don't have to starve themselves through traditional anorexia. They can eat everything they want. They can enjoy the sensation of eating it and swallowing it and digesting it, which has its all of its wow. own gratification. And all they have to do is not poke themselves with a needle and inject their insulin. That's a condition called diabulimia. And all of this is just to say there are two parts. The fat cell must be told to store insulin or to store fat via high insulin, but it needs sufficient calories to fuel that growth. It's one thing to tell the fat cell, let's grow, then the fat cell has to grow.